certainly good to see all of you here on this fine holiday morning. We have a number of guests, and we want you to know that we're truly happy that you're here to worship God with us. We're glad that you came. We're glad you had safe travel here, and we pray that you have safe travel as you journey from us. Many have come from a distance. Today we're going to begin reading from Matthew chapter 1 and beginning in verse 18. Immediately after the genealogy in Matthew, we read these words. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. This will be the title for our lesson this morning. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, desired to put her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place that was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph arose from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took her as his wife and kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Starting usually before Thanksgiving, people start gearing up for the year-end holiday season, and some even start shopping the after-Christmas sales preparing for next year. There will be some, no doubt, out tomorrow looking around trying to find bargains for what they can give maybe their mother-in-law next year for Christmas you listen to the TV, you've heard about the sales percentages. Whether retail sales are as good last year as they were this year, how it will affect the economy, how the retailers are going to be making out. You've heard the words that I just read, or a variation of them, uh, this story in song and uh, in verse on the radio, on television, in the shopping centers where you may have gone shopping the last few days or weeks, as well as displays in homes and churches. So a lot of people are thinking about the holiday season. They're thinking about the birth of Christ and his coming into the world, and they hear it from all kinds of areas, whether they're thinking of it or not, they almost have to think of it. But many people will keep up their lights that they displayed on their houses and businesses and so forth uh, through the new year. But there are a great many people that will forget all about the Savior starting tomorrow, the 26th of December. The Bible does not reveal the date of Jesus' birth although the events described would indicate that it was probably in the spring or summer. Uh, probably not, more likely not in midwinter. And so later religious people in the third century and after that begin to, and especially after the church became popular in the Roman Empire, begin to try to inject Christianity into the heathens there and so they chose some of the heathen feast around the first of the year to try to inject some Christianity into it and uh, the birth of Christ then was eventually said about that time. Neither are we instructed to celebrate, celebrate the birth of Christ in any religious way but we are to acknowledge it and the fact that it's, that story is there and we must acknowledge it and it's vital to our salvation that we do that. These words the angel spoke to jo Joseph are relevant and very important 
at all times of the year, not just this season of the year. And in this lesson, I want to call attention to and focus on some facts surrounding this story and this situation. Our scripture reading reveals two of the Savior's names. Jesus, his personal name, uh, tells us about his humanity. Jesus means Savior. In order to save us, Jesus had to come in the flesh. In Hebrews 2 and verse 14, the writer says, Since the children, since then the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had power over death, that is the devil. And so Jesus had to come in the flesh in order to render Satan powerless over death where he had this power. Jesus was subject to all the same human feelings as we are while he was on this earth. He had a physical birth and childhood, the same as we do, and that's what you've heard so much about in this season uh, that we're in right now. Uh, Luke 2, 7 says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them at the inn. And then you go down to verse 40, and it says, And the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So he grew up and had a childhood like we had a childhood. He also felt weariness and hunger and thirst. And all of these are brought out in one verse where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John. Verse 6 says, Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, was setting thus by the well. And it was about the sixth hour, and there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. He was thirsty. And it says, For his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. And no doubt he was hungry or would soon be hungry if he wasn't at that point in time. Jesus also felt sorrow and grief when others grieve like we often do, whenever we're trying to comfort our loved ones, our friends, whenever they lose somebody. When Lazarus died, Jesus lamented at the grief of Mary and Martha. This rather shortest verse in the Bible, rather benign, John 11, 35, says Jesus wept. But actually, the idea is, when you look at that, was well, he lamented over that. He wailed and cried over that situation. He also did that over the city of Jerusalem. In Luke 13, 33, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those that to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under wings, and you would not have it. Also in Luke, the 19th chapter, and verse 41, when he approached the city, this was in his triumphant entry, the time of his triumph in entering the city of Jerusalem, just before his death and his resurrection. He said he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you the things which make for peace, but now you have, uh, these things have been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you. And you will not leave and they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. He came, entered triumphantly, and within the week was crucified by the people of Jerusalem. Jesus was tempted just as we are. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 it said, He was one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was not a doctrine. He was not a law. He was not a principle while living on this earth. He was a living, breathing, feeling person just like you and me with one difference. He was the Son of God, and he was without sin. 
But the next name that is revealed brings that out because he was called Emmanuel, his divine name, and it reminds us of his divinity. Emmanuel, as is said in the text, means God with us. Isaiah prophesied 750 years before, the Jesus, before Jesus was born, saying in Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. The announcement of the angel fulfilled this prophecy. In Matthew 1, 22, where we were reading a moment ago, it said, Now this took place, that that which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. The Apostle John added his part of this testimony in the very beginning of his gospel in John 1 and verse 1. When he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then in verse 14, he said, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So he came to this earth as God and as man, and he lived among us in the flesh. To know Jesus is to know God. We can only come to know God in the New Testament age through Jesus and the revelation that he gave. I think of an incident near the end of his ministry when in John 14 and verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you will know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it will suffice for us. It is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words which I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe on the count of the works themselves. Can we really know Jesus today? You think, well, we weren't there. We didn't, you know, we weren't there personally. Well, what does it mean to know somebody? Well, to me, it means that I know how they feel about things. That I know what they think. And I know how they act. And I know how they react to things. And when I know this well, I know that person. And we can know all of this through the Word. We can know Jesus through the Word. He has revealed the Father and himself to us through the scriptures, and we can know him. In fact, you can probably know him better than the person sitting next to you in the pew this morning. You know why? Because he will never lie to you. He will never deceive you. He will never trick you. Now, I'm not saying the person next to you, next to you is going to do that necessarily. I'm just saying because we're human, that is certainly a possibility that we can do that to each other, and sometimes we do do that to each other. And sometimes it catches us by surprise because we think, I didn't think that person would do that to me. But you can know Jesus that he will never do that to you, that what he says is true and what he revealed is is what will always be true about it. So you can know Jesus today better than you can know your neighbor or your friends. Jesus was human, yet at the same time he was divine, conceived not by Joseph, but of course by the Holy Spirit. Now the second thing is that our scripture reveals is the Savior's mission. 
His mission is also stated by the angel as we go back to our text in Matthew 1 and verse 21. It said, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Jesus did not come to save people in their sins, but he came to save people from their sins. You know, a fireman doesn't uh, save a person in a burning house. You seldom read, well, this fireman ran into the burning house to save first. No, he, he saved him by taking him out of the burning house, not inside the burning house. There's certainly a difference. He took him out. I remember many years ago when I was a young man, uh, one of our neighbors' houses caught on fire, and he got him and himself and his family all out, but just as he got out, he turned around and he realized that he had some paper money in there. All the money that he had was in his wallet laying in that house. And you know what fire does to paper money. And so he turned and he tried to rush back into that house and his neighbors restrained him and held him back to keep him from running back into the house. They probably saved his life. I've known many people who have escaped from sin and then like this man run and try to turn back and run back into sin because of material things or worldly desires or sexual desires or some other reason. But Jesus wants to save us from the love and practice of sin, you see. And this is the only way that we can truly be saved. Otherwise, whenever we're tempted, we will run back into sin. Now, if we just restrain ourselves from sin and, and we're looking at it and we think, wow, I'd like to do that. Boy, I remember when I did that. Boy, I know one time whenever I did this. Wouldn't it be good if I could do this again? No, you'll run back into it if that's your thinking. Jesus wants to save us from the love and practice of sin. Jesus wants us to be free from the pollution of sin from the stain of sin, from the shame of sin, from the misery it brings, from the guilt of it, and from the eternal damnation that it will bring to our souls, from the consequences of sin. In Romans 6 and verse 23, it says, The wages of sin is death, but the free will of God is eternal life in our Lord, in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is the unique mission of the Savior. If you look out at nature, nature destroys the weak and nourishes the strong. But Jesus strengthens the weak and rescues the perishing. Jesus said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19, 10. Because it was his mission, it becomes our mission also. What his mission was is ours too. Our scripture reading also reveals the Savior's power. The fact that he can save denotes, denotes the Savior's power. His saving power is spiritual in nature. However, he could call up any physical uh, strength that he so desired. He was able to, at a word, calm a storm that was about to sink the boat where he and his apostles were riding. And yet, no one is forced to obey him. He draws people with love. God spoke through Jeremiah the prophet and said this, I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have drawn you with loving kindness, Jeremiah 31 and verse 3. And again, during his ministry, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments in John 14 and verse 15. With all the power of heaven and earth, Jesus certainly has the power to save. Matthew 28 and verse 18 Jesus came to his apostles just before his ascension into heaven, and he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Authority, of course, is power, and the King James Verse uses power in that text. Jesus can save us completely when we draw near to God through him. Hebrews 7.23 says, And the former priest, on the one hand, existed in greater numbers because they were prevented by death from continuing. They died, their sons took over. They died, and their sons took over. But he, on the other hand, because he abides forever, holds his priesthood permanently. 
Hence also he is able to save forever those to draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. He'll always be there. He's there every time we need him. And he can save the worst kind of sinner, not in but from their sins. In the book, the letter to Corinth, first letter to Corinth, he talks about some of the some of the people, some of the brethren that had become brethren there, what kind of lifestyle they lived previous to this. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, he said, Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. Notice what he says now. And such were some of you. This is the kind of people you were before you were converted. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. So Jesus has the power to save and the fourth thing I want to point out is that our scripture tells us that Jesus had a plan for salvation. The Savior not only had the power, but he also had a plan for saving people. Since God is impartial in his dealing with people, there is just one plan. And it's the only plan that he has, and it's for all people. Peter realized this when he was sent to the Gentiles for the first time. He had, as we talked about in our class this morning, had already preached uh, that the gospel was to the Gentiles, but he didn't realize that. And so when it came time for him to go to the Gentiles, God had to give him a special vision in order to make him know that the Gentiles needed saving and that he could go to them. And so when he gets there in 10, uh, Acts 10, verse 34 and 35, it said he opened his mouth and Peter said, I almost certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and who does what is right is welcome to him. And so he then taught Cornelius and his household. He doesn't have one plan for the Jews and one plan for the Gentiles or one plan for this group and another plan for that group or another plan for this individual and another plan for that individual. Now there are some who call themselves dispensationalists that teach that there is a plan for the Jews and a plan for the Gentiles, and they're different. But there is no biblical support for that. The Bible teaches the opposite. In fact, whenever this problem came up, G, uh, Peter uh, said concerning the Gentiles, he said, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way they also are in Acts 15 and verse 11. What he's saying is, we Jews and those Gentiles were saved in the very same way with the same plan. Jesus gave this plan to his disciples before he left this earth. His disciples were told to teach the lost baptize the ones taught, and then teach the ones that they baptize. In Matthew 28, 18, after saying that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth, he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So he said, Make disciples, teach, baptize, and then teach more. Now the ones who hear the gospel and the ones who believe the gospel and the ones who obey the gospel are the ones that are going to be saved. In Mark 16 and verse 15, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. He who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Now, when Nicodemus came to him to, by night, he taught the same thing literally to Nicodemus. In John 3 and verse 5, he finally explains to Nicodemus. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So there's, there's elements 
the water and spirit in which you enter into the kingdom of God. And corresponding to that, Peter taught the very same thing on the day of Pentecost when the people responded to him and said, after he had taught them the gospel, after he had taught them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they responded to him and wanted to know what to do. And he said, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2.38, water and spirit. So these are some of the things that we can see surrounding the birth of Jesus that is taught and how it played out. But you know, people pray for Jesus to save them from many things, from diseases of the body. I often pray with people who are sick and in the hospital, from sad and heavy and grieving hearts whenever we lose some loved one, some friend, from financial disaster whenever we're threatened by the economy that is so prevalent around us at this point. And from the storm and fire and the flood, from physical disaster. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. We should be praying about these things and about all kinds of things. But the last thing many people want for salvation is from their sins. And this is because people love their sins more than they love God. Now, they would settle for salvation in their sins, and I've had a lot of people tell me things like, well, I'm a good person. I don't cheat. I don't steal. I don't kill. I don't uh, cheat my neighbors. I'm good to my neighbors. I do some good things. And so why am I not? God's going to save me because I'm a nice person. But they've never done anything that God said to do in order to have forgiveness of their sins, and their sins still separate from God. Now, they want to be saved in their sins, and they want to be saved on their own merit and on their own plan. But Jesus wants to save you from your sins, not in your sins. Some people feel when they've refused the invitation of Jesus that they're just putting off a decision. That's not so. You're really making a decision. You're making a decision when you do that not to accept Jesus as Savior, not to repent, not to do the things that Jesus said in order to have forgiveness of sins that we just talked about. Jesus wants to save you from your sins. Salvation is found in obedience to God's will. The Hebrew writer talked about Jesus' obedience and ours. In Hebrews 5, 8 and 9, he said, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. He followed the plan explicitly that he and the Father knew from the beginning. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. He is the source, but to those who obey him. So, would you be saved today in the name of Jesus? If you're not already in that position, would you be saved? Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. If you need God's salvation, then we'll do our best. We'll do our part. If you do your part, what we say, and sing the same. Oh, well,